Well, good morning, everyone. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter and the stories that set your agenda. U.S. stocks hit fresh highs on hopes for a soft landing. This after Switzerland's central bank fires a starting gun on rate cuts. Stocks in Asia broadly retreating today. Double trouble for Apple. The iPhone maker loses over $110 billion in value after the U.S. Justice Department sues over antitrust violations. Will European regulators prepare their own probe into the company? Plus, Reddit shares soar 48 percent on their debut in New York as investors latch on to the social media company's AI pitch. Now, first thing is first, let's check the futures and then some of the cross assets that we need to be across. It all started in the U.S. with, of course, a lot of pressure from companies, including Apple, but also Alphabet. Now, this relentless rally in stocks that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, uh, this comes from optimism that the Fed, of course, will be able to engineer a pretty soft landing, which would bolster the outlook for corporate earnings. Now, a record bout of risk-taking drove the S&P 500 yesterday to its 20th record. And you can see uh, on the back of that, your stock's 50 futures down three-tenths of 8%. When you look at NASDAQ futures, though, they're practically unchanged. Again, this U.S. economic data that we had yesterday from the U.S. really supported the way forward and the argument that the Fed may be forced to backtrack on some of its rate decision forecast a day after the central bank clearly indicated through the dot plot, but also through its other messaging that they're looking at three cuts this year. Cross-asset, what does this mean for dollar? One of the biggest stories, of course, of the year is how a dollar has been behaving since the start of the year. Uh, the other thing we need to watch out for, it's been a big old week, I have to say, for it's almost like a marriage on central banks. So I'm looking at the U.S. two-year yield uh, for 6062 dollar. You can see 1,244. And then we look at yen. The yen little change again trading around uh, this level of 151, 152. Market still staying focus on whether the BOJ might follow its first interest rate hike since 2007 with further increases later this year. And you can see yuan, one of the biggest stories today, 72619. Now let's see how Asian markets are faring with with Avril Hong in Singapore. Hi, Avril. Hi. We are seeing a very interesting picture emerging in the Asia-Pacific. I mean, there is a lot of selling going on. The risks seem to be abounding. A uh, gauge of stocks in the region pulling back from that roughly two-year high yesterday. And today, it is the Chinese stocks that are leading those declines. It's not just about the central bank uh, upsets that we're getting. It's also about the geopolitics. SMIC, Chinese chipmaker, according to a U.S. official, may have broken American law. And then we have traders also bracing for earnings scorecard from some of the biggest Chinese property developers next week. Vanka, Country Garden. Long for today reporting already missing estimates. So as you can imagine, there's really not a lot of appetite for risk. Chinese tech leading the decline. CSI 300, Hang Seng, both also very negative, although they have been pairing some of the declines from earlier on in the session. Let's take a look because as you say, Fran, it is about the Chinese renminbi as well. And we saw the PBOC today spooking investors as it set the yuan fix above 710 for the first time in two weeks. The signal it seems to be sending is allowing the Chinese currency to weaken as the economy slows and traders were not pricing for this or position for this. So we saw the yuan weaken to the four-year lows uh, against the green bag and the onshore yuan particularly breached that key 720 level. Now let's flip the board and take a look at where we're seeing cross assets in Japan as there's a bit of a bright spot today coming from the Nikkei, from the topics, uh, as the Japanese currency is still relatively cheap. Uh, but we also had data today that kind of supports what we're seeing on the Japanese currency with the inflation picture accelerating and that key question are we going to see another hike from the boj this year the million dollar trillion dollar question avril thank you so much avril hong there in singapore now from zurich to tokyo and london to washington it's been certainly a big week for central banks switzerland was the big surprise with its rate cut but of course plenty of focus on the fed's expectation for three cuts this year now for more on all of this let's bring in bloomberg opinion columnist dan moss dan so good to speak to you so there was so much excitement about that snb cut i think two or three banks had predicted it but there are there broader lessons from this surprise well francine uh the astonishment is completely justified and in that sense the snb has been the real outlier in a heavy week for central banks 
there's a couple of things about this that are quite unique to Switzerland. Uh, this is a central bank which has pegged and de-pegged its currency. This is a central bank which went into negative interest rates. Even when they began hiking, the nominal level of rates was quite low relative to the other uh, developed economies. So lots of excitement there, but a little bit of an aberration. Not really where the bulk of the direction this week has been. Now, the Bank of Japan, and we've, I mean, it was three days ago, this was a huge deal, okay? It's end to the yield curve control has been described as historic. Is there another way, Dan, to look at it? Yeah, it's historic in the sense that they've basically eradicated the legacy of Haruhiko Kuroda. It's like <laughs> the guy never existed, farewell, bye-bye. But monetary policy remains very accommodative in Japan by most traditional yardsticks. Look, we went from minus 0 0.1 on the main rate to around zero. And they have formally abandoned efforts to peg the 10-year government bond yield, but they're still buying lots of them. They're not out of the market by any stretch of the imagination. The path forward from here, I think if I was Kazuo Ueda after a year in the job, I'd look back and say, well, I dismantled all that previous guy's stuff. Uh, now we've got some uh, clear sailing ahead of us. We bettered that down. Can't that just be victory enough? Why do we have to start talking about the next hike? Dan, thank you so much. I mean, this goes to your column saying, look, just don't expect uh, this rate hike from the BOJ to be the start of a cycle. Dan Moss, they're in D.C. Now, more than $110 billion has been wiped off the value of Apple after regulators in the U.S. sued it for violating antitrust laws. Well, Merrick Garland, the U.S. attorney general, said the iPhone maker had dominated the market by stifling innovation. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. Apple says it will vigorously defend against the lawsuit, describing it as wrong on the facts and the law. Well, with us now is Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Alex, there, there was definitely European flavor, right? The DOJ now becoming much more like the commission than some of the regulation that we've seen in the past. What are they actually accused of? It essentially comes down to five things. Firstly, it's accused of preventing super apps from operating on the platform. That's apps where, where you can go in and then subsequently download further services or access further services. It says it blocks cloud streaming services. So that might be gaming offerings that you access through a phone. Of course, the thing about that is if you're accessing a cloud streaming service, then you don't necessarily need the, all the, the whiz-bang tech in your iPhone. There's the what's known as sort of the green bubble effect. That's like when you text a phone that isn't an iPhone, you get a different message in response. Opening that up, uh, tight integration between the watch and the iPhone it excludes competitors. That's what uh, the, the penultimate accusation is. And the final one is that it blocks developers from accessing Apple's wallet. And so you're using contactless payments, not accessing it, but developing their own, so using their own contactless payments. And Apple's also facing action in the EU, but does this change the business model or is it just tweaks to open it up a little bit more? Well, the thing that's interesting in the EU is actually they've changed the law, right? And so they now are, have changed the law, and now it's whether they are following this new law. In the US, it's being argued on the basis of the existing law. So that provides a slightly different threat to Apple there, um, and it pertains actually to how they've reacted to these law changes. OK, so it's not, are we expecting them actually to change something quite quickly? I mean, again, if you're Apple and we telegraphed this, right, we were expecting this. Is it that the DOJ went a little bit harder on Apple than we thought they would? In all honesty, we didn't quite know. We knew they were investigating a lot no. of different things. It trans we, I think there was a suspicion they would pick on one or two of those things. I suppose, yes, in a sense, they've kind of gone for all of them. Wider. So it is quite yeah. broad, yeah. OK, Alex, thank you so much. As always, Alex Webb there, who covers tech for us. Now, Reddit shares soared almost 50% in their trading debut as its AI pitch got a warm reception from investors. Now, the social media platform has a deal with Google to use Reddit content for training AI models. Well, Jen Wong, chief operating officer of Reddit, says... She she expects the platform's data licensing business to continue to grow. 
this, uh, the Reddit's corpus of data is incredibly valuable, and it gets more valuable because as there's more, uh, more uh, content that's generated maybe by AI or computers, original human thoughts and ideas increase in value, right? If you think about it, a new car comes out. Who's going to review it? A real-life family of six can actually tell you what it's like to drive that car. That's always going to be valuable. And so, you know, whether that shows up in data licensing or in the products that Reddit builds, it is valuable. Now, for more on this, let's go to Bloomberg's Julia Fioretti in Dubai. Julia, good morning. So what does this actually say about Reddit's bet on AI? And what does it tell us about the broader sign of IPO confidence returning? Well, and see, basically on the bet on AI, it's telling us that investors have bought into it for now. They believe that the growth will come from um, Reddit increasingly uh, using AI or allowing AI to train using its um, troves of, of human generated data, of user data. Um, obviously, it remain, there's the, obviously the first day exuberance and that will remain to be seen whether it gets borne out in the subsequent results. Um, but it's certainly it's a positive sign. Um, and it's also a positive sign for the broader IPO market in terms of other tech companies that may have been waiting on the sidelines and which have been waiting for quite a long time for the market to reopen. Um, it's not fully open yet, but certainly it's, it's a very encouraging sign and others are certainly bound to follow and investors are getting a little bit more optimistic. Um, and this basically already we've seen an increase of more than 150 percent in IPO volumes in the US year on year. So it's um, a very good start to the year, clearly. So interesting, Julia. Thank you so much, Julia Fioretti there. Now, this is what's coming up, of course, in the day ahead. First of all, UK retail sales. This is on the back of what we heard from the Bank of England yesterday, laying really the groundwork for a shift to rate cuts. After one of the sharpest turnarounds in guidance in recent memory, we have data releases that could support, of course, the path forward. We did also a little bit earlier on, I think around midnight, um, got some UK consumer data, certainly one of the most upbeat figures about personal finance since 2021. And this is GFK uh, saying that a key measure of consumer confidence has stalled at minus 21 in March. And that was after a drop in February. Now, the other thing we're watching out for is a German IFO. Germany in the last couple of quarters uh, really seen as one of the most troublesome economies in the euro area. In fact, this goes for the two largest economies continuing to contract. I'm thinking of France, but Germany as well. Germany's downturn Ease somewhat. Uh, this was solely due to the service se te sector, which came close to stabilizing. So it'll be interesting to see the forward expectations on that IFO sur survey. And then we also have the Russia rate decision on the back of Vladimir Putin getting another term on the back of us trying to analyze uh, what assets freezing actually means for the Russian economy and whether they can still circumvent some of the sanctions uh, put in place because of the invasion of Ukraine. Coming up, strong support amongst EU leaders to use profits from frozen Russian assets to support Ukraine's war efforts. Of course, we get the latest from the second day of the summit. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. To Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, everyone. Now, European Union President Ursula von der Leyen says there's a strong support to use money from frozen Russian assets for Ukraine. Well, von der Leyen spoke alongside European Council President Charles Michel at a press conference during the first day of the European Union summit. There's a strong support uh, to use, um, at the moment, being the um, windfall profits or proceeds of the uh, immobilized assets for military purposes for Ukraine. And um, I told the leaders that if we are swift now in uh, concluding the proposal, we could disperse the first billion on the 1st of July already. Well, that was the European Union, European Commission president. Let's go now to Bloomberg's Oliver Kirk in Brussels. Oli, many, many questions about the legality and actually how you put that in place. But how likely is it that this support could reach Ukraine by July 1st, and how much difference could that make? 
It would make a substantial difference because it would be another financing vehicle that finally the EU and the United States can tap in order to get money over to Ukraine. And that is really the fundamental question here. How do you get the funding for Ukraine, for its military, for its budget on sustainable footing? And this question of Russian assets will be absolutely crucial to figuring that out, particularly when you have a lot of political problems around getting money to Ukraine in the United States, here in Europe. So what would be interesting is getting that sort of interest, those um, those windfall process, getting them, there's about three billion of them annually. But what what I think is really interesting, Francine, is this proposal that the United States has come out with. And I think we're going to hear a lot more about this over the next coming weeks and months. The U.S. has branded these freedom bonds. And the idea here is in order to tap onto those underlying assets and a lot more value of that money is actually packaging it up into kind of the future earnings of those assets. So not just the three billion, but that every year for the years to come and get that to Ukraine now. And they're talking about something closer to $50 billion worth of value. And we know that the United States wants to actually seize those assets the 260 billion that are sitting there frozen by the G7 and get them to Ukraine. But legally and politically, that will be very difficult. So this other sort of freedom bond avenue might be the way to do it. Yeah, it's difficult to see legally actually the way forward. So what progress, Ali, has been made on other key issues? Yeah, so the other key issues are on Gaza and the Middle East and Israel. There is some stronger language coming out talking about um, the violence and the desperate situation in Gaza. So there was that appears to be in the text, and we'll get that out um, tomorrow. What will also be interesting are these uh, d discussions about accession of Bosnia, um, uh, Ukraine, and Moldova. These are things that the news we had overnight was that they're opening uh, opening talks about Bosnia to join the EU. And this is significant, Francine, because this is sort of accelerating the process at a time when Europe is sort of vying for many of these countries that sit between Russia and Europe in terms of the orbit of influence. And Europe really wants to make this move faster. The last country to join was Croatia. That took 10 years. So what's interesting now is the EU is looking at potentially a tiered system or progressive joining of the EU that Ukraine and others might have, where you get sort of um, a carrot and stick, where you get some benefits of coming into the EU without having to do the full process all at once, which takes many, many years at this stage. Ollie, thank you so much. Oliver Crook there for us, of course, in Brussels. Now to some of the other stories making news. And the International Monetary Fund has approved $880 million in loans to Ukraine. Now the payment is the first installment of a $15 billion loan package approved last year. The funds will help bolster Kyiv's finances as aid from the U.S. remains stalled. A top Israeli official says his country will invade the southern Gaza city of Rafah, no matter what the U.S. says. While speaking on a U.S. podcast, Ron Dermer, the Israeli strategic affairs minister, said that Israel will, quote, finish the job and defeat Hamas. Well, Dermer is set to head to Washington next week for talks with the Biden administration. Coming up, high voltage EVs are deep dive on why 800 volt electric vehicles are on the rise and why some companies are actually opting out. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. But now next generation electric vehicles are adopting higher voltage charging. It means faster recharge times, but only if the infrastructure can actually keep up. Now for more on all of this, I'm joined by Ryan Fisher, head of Bloomberg NEF's EV charging team. That's one of the coolest titles I've, I've ever heard. Um, Ryan, so there's a lot of buzz around this 800 volts EVs. What's the actual big deal with this technology? Yeah, so if you imagine the first generation technology, the Volkswagen ID4, you might get 200 kilometers in about 20 minutes. Now, these next generations can do 200 kilometers in 10 minutes. And BMW, with their new model yesterday, says we can do 300 kilometers in 10 minutes. And one of the enablers of that is this 800 volt platform. So it sounds all quite technical, but actually, uh, those technologies are an important enabler of these faster charging time that consumers want. And what we've seen is that this was kind of thought about Porsche Taycan type models, but actually coming to the mass market. Um, so seven out of ten of the biggest automakers by revenue now saying we're going to have these 800 volt platforms. So that's important because it means there's going to be more supply chains building up. And as that happens, the cost can probably come down and then more people can basically be enabled for faster charging times um, moving forward as well. But right. Seven out of ten. That means three are actually not deciding to take part of this. So what are their concerns and who are they? Yeah. So maybe unsurprisingly, if you follow the um, automotive industry, Toyota, Ford, Honda, 
Um, doesn't mean they're not researching this, but they've not formally announced right. platforms in the same way that the other companies have announced them. Um, in some ways, what you can think is maybe they're going to be behind in the technology. So if you don't have this and you're going to go and buy an electric car and it doesn't go as fast, you, you may move to another provider. So you could say they're behind. What I have started to see is like the fast follower race could be a good position to be in. So if you're a fast follower, maybe you're taking advantage of the supply chain that's built up, the lower costs, and there's a lot of design differences between the cars. So the whole platform could be designed in a slightly better way to take advantage. And then not only that, but you've seen a lot of um, the EV manufacturers have issues at the moment. I mean, Fisco was in the news the other day. So the latest and greatest technology sounds brilliant, but if you can't service it, then you've got a problem. So the Fords and Toyotas of this world, they, they have obviously massive networks that you can go to as a consumer and a big consumer base already. So it doesn't write them out of it. And no doubt you'd expect in future their EVs to have these platforms as well. I mean, I kind of think of my iPhone charger and the fact that we went through like USB-C and then B and it keeps on changing. Is yeah. there a danger that it happens the same for some of these, you know, 800 volt EV chargers? And so as an individual, does it make it more difficult to like plug in and do it myself? Yeah, and obviously um, it sounds like a cool title that I've got, but it's, it really is quite complicated charging. And from a consumer perspective, when you're trying to buy a vehicle, people, the average Joe doesn't want to know about that. So you've no. got the early adopters, right. they kind of do, and then the later people, not so much. Um, so the 800 volt EV is another complication in that, yes, you can charge at any of these fast chargers, but actually if you want to get the max uh, amount of power that's been advertised in these kind of like 300 kilometers in 10 minutes, you can only go to a certain amount of the chargers. Now the good news is, one, last year there was double the amount of uh, ultra fast chargers at the end of the year than there was the start of the year. Where, in the US or worldwide? Uh, this was just in Europe, okay. sorry. Okay. Um, but the US also uh, rolling more of this infrastructure out. Uh, and then these 800 volt ones coming. So places like Germany, real focus. They're selling a lot of vehicles and the government is putting in things like multi-billion dollar grants uh, basically to install the chargers and the fastest ones of those that will do these kind of charge times that BMW are around. So, right, what about the companies that are basically doing these chargers, right? Can they make good money out of it or is it still early days? Yeah, so in the fastest charging, what I'd say is the automakers are near the top of the list. So you've got this joint venture called Ionity. Um, they're near the top. You've got another one in the U.S. called Iona that's just been announced. So I think they've realized there's still a gap. But it's an interesting market because you've got the oil and gas, you've got the utilities, all of these different companies coming in um, and basically realizing this is an opportunity and it's only going to get bigger and they can take share from the oil and gas majors. Um, will it be profitable? Well, Shell the, uh, the other day released their energy transition strategy 2024 and they say we're expecting, uh, we want to have in our EV charging division greater, internal, greater than 12% internal rate of return. So that gives you an idea of where it's at. Obviously, a lot of considerations for a company like Shell, though. Yeah. So they're saying we're going to divest a thousand of our fuel stations as well. So we're going to see big changes in that whole market of fueling yeah. um, to EV charging. I mean, does it put a lot of pressure on the grid in general? Um, I guess. So the, the thing about this, particularly when you think about these fast charging stations, is they can be multi megawatt. So you've got that for passenger vehicles, you've got it for truck charging as well, which can basically be as much energy as you need for a whole town. So lots of money needs to be invested there. So interesting. Ryan, thank you so much. Uh, Ryan Fisher, their head of Bloomberg ENEF's EV charging team. Now, let's also quick, uh, take a quick look, actually, at what we're seeing across the board. And dollar has been uh, talking uh, quite a lot. I mean, they haven't been talking to traders who are trading dollar. Um, against almost all of its G10 peers, has been surging against uh, some emerging Asian markets as well. Again, this unexpected rate reduction by the S&B spurred speculation that other major central banks will reduce their policy rates faster. And that's playing out in European futures, you can see stocks down two tenths of a percent for the euro stocks. 50 futures coming up. Nike shares fall in after hours trading as it warns that sales will take a hit this year. We'll talk about that next. And this is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. U.S. stocks hit fresh highs on hopes for a soft landing. This after Switzerland's central bank fires a starting gun on rate cuts, while stocks in Asia broadly retreating today. Double trouble for Apple. The iPhone maker loses over 110 
$1.5 billion in value after the U.S. Justice Department sues over antitrust violations. European regulators prepare their own probe into the company. Plus, Reddit shares soar 48% on their debut in New York as investors latch onto the social media company's AI pitch. Now, let's uh, quickly get onto your markets. If you look at futures across the board, a little bit of pressure, maybe a little bit of pause for reflection after the incredible rally that we saw, especially in the U.S. We did have late yesterday a bit of a pre-market, um, I guess, you know, concern for Apple, but also Alphabet. But overall, thanks to NVIDIA this week and thank you to uh, Micron, a lot of U.S. stocks were on a tear. Now, this is the picture overall for S&P futures, practically unchanged. Maybe a little bit of concern in the U.S. stocks, 50 futures, but we watch for any indication, of, especially from IFO, about what kind of economy we'll be left with in Europe. And then very quickly, treasuries and dollar, probably the one that I really uh, would like to watch. The other one is, of course, onshore yuan dropping. You know, th that breach is a closely watched technical level after Chinese authorities are trying to manage the current the U.S. two-year yield for 0.6084. Now, sportswear brands Nike and Lululemon both fell in after-hours trading after lowering their sales outlooks. Nike says it expects revenue to fall as it shuffles out older merchandise, while Lululemon says the U.S. market has slowed down. Well, Bloomberg opinion columnist Andrea Felstead is with me now. So, Andrea, so good to speak to you early and bright in the morning to understand the retail <laughs> complex in the U.S. So what's going on with Nike and Lululemon? Well, I think there are three things going on here for the sportswear companies. You've got the great rotation away from the pandemic casual wear to more formal styles. You've got the great inflation, pressure on consumers. But you've got this third factor, which I call the great fragmentation. Now, particularly for Nike and Adidas too, years ago they could sell products to everyone, every category, every price point. Now, what we've got now is, is we've got all these little rivals. They're not little, they're all small, but they're all nibbling away at various bits of their business. And you've got Lulu doing that to Nike and Adidas, but Lulu itself is being uh, attacked by Primark, by... Uh, by uh, Inditex, it's Oisho brand. So they have to adapt. And what it means is when you've got specialists taking sports areas, you, they almost become like mid-market fashion brands. Right. So they have to have a, a, a constant supply of new and exciting products. And what they've both done, Adidas and Nike, is they've relied on these big sellers that burn very bright yeah. and then they fade. And for Nike, it was the Air Jordan 1, mm -hmm. the Air Force 1. And they've got it, and that's fading. Nike is in the ascendance when it comes to products. So Nike has got to adapt get and get new styles in. But obviously, that's going to be painful as they, yeah. you know, as they pull back on those best sellers and hopefully bring in best sellers to come and, and we don't know whether they are right. going to resonate with consumers. So what does that mean for example for Adidas? Well I think there's very limited read across for Adidas. Adidas is suffering for all, with all these same problems but Bjorn Gordon, the new CEO comes from more of a fashion background. He was at Puma which is more fashion orientated and he seems to have got a very good grip on what is going on in this market. He's, he's, he's noticed that He's, I mean, he's got the advantage because his styles, the Samba, the Terrace, the, uh, the uh, Gazelle, all these sort of, you know, these retro sneakers are in the ascent. He's noticed that those were coming to the fore a couple of years ago. And so last year he ramped up production of them. And importantly, he seems to be figuring out where they're going to go next. He's introducing a variation, the SL72, which is a running version. It, incidentally, an Olympic sneaker, so it's got Olympic heritage. He's noticed that sort of what he calls these low-profile sneakers were cropping up on the catwalk. So he's gone into the archive and he's, he, he's re-energised re these because he thinks they will be bestsellers. And he's noticed that, you know, athletes... Yep. are becoming more fashionable. So he's trying to bridge the gap between fashion and athletes, making you know performance wear more stylish, dressing athletes more fashionable. So I, I think that obviously there's a read across if demand is slowing, uh, which Nike seemed to indicate it was, but I think the read across for, for Adidas is, is limited. I mean, as always, if you have the right product, if you're very nice to Andrew, she might actually send you her top 10, right, <laughs> trainers to wear into the summer. Bloomberg opinion columnist Andrea Feldman that they're fun as always. Now, let's pivot back to the central bank story. It's been a big week for policy 
policymakers with Switzerland's rate cut, the standout surprise. Now, for more on all this, let's get straight to Jackie Bowie, managing partner and head of EMEA at Chatham Financial. Jackie, good to speak to you. So we were on air yesterday. We also spoke to the former S&B president, Philip Hildebrand, who says, well, this was the right thing to do if you look internally at some of you know what, what the Swiss economy was doing. And I thought it still takes very brave president or governor to do it because it's a small open economy. Is there a read across to what Switzerland has done and what it means for other countries? Yeah, well, obviously, everyone's waiting for who would be the first big central bank to cut interest rates this year. And and then the Swiss have gone first. Um, And their rates are already still, um, you know, relatively low if we look at where they are compared to the UK and the US. So people certainly looked at that and said, well, what does this mean for what the Bank of England might do, the ECB? Um, And also we got a good indication from the Bank of England yesterday that they are definitely at the end of the rate increase cycle. Um, Now, when the first rate cut will come in the UK, it still looks like it's likely to be after the summer. So what do you make about, you know, of the Fed? Does the ECB, it's, it's very clear that actually the ECB and the Fed telegraphed clearly when they will go and maybe by how much they will go, although they keep on saying they're data dependent. Are they clearer than when the Bank of England will go? Yeah, well, it, you generally get a better sense from the Fed. Um, and obviously the market um, would look at the dot plot, which which is what we look at as soon as the Fed makes an announcement. And it's very clear that there's, you know, kind of three 25 basis point cuts expected in the US um, in this year alone, um, with the first one likely to come around the, the June 11th, 12th meeting. Um, now, obviously, the US is in quite a different position from an economic perspective because the growth has just been so strong there. So, you know, they've got, um, they could they could probably wait a little bit longer um, before they start to cut. Coming across to the ECB and the Bank of England, you know, the European and the UK economies are um, struggling much more from a growth perspective. So the central banks are under a little bit more pressure to try and cut those rates to stimulate growth. Um, in the UK, again, it's still not really expected that that first cut will come until after the summer. Um, But interestingly, the same um, expectation in the UK that we'll get three 25 basis points cuts um, this side of 2024. So, so Jackie, I mean, I'm quite into the dot plot because actually it's a good snapshot at that time. Some of the forward expectations. I know there was a lot of chatter this week about the median average of some of the Fed fund rates and what that tells us about cuts coming. But then yesterday we had housing and manufacturing, also labor market released in the U.S. pointing to a resilient economy. Does that change some of what we heard from Jay Powell the previous day? I don't think it changes it dramatically because I think the market's got quite used to these um, stronger economic numbers coming through, particularly in the US. Um, But, you know, we have had a massive change, really, if we think back to where we were in, um, you know, like November last year, where the market was pricing in some pretty aggressive rate cuts for the US. And now we're down to, you know, just just three cuts this year and an expectation that we might get to a neutral rate in the US of about two and a half to two point seven five percent, which is pretty low. Um, over the next couple of years. Um, the same in the UK, and in fact, the Bank of England also announced their market participant survey yesterday, where you know they are saying three rate cuts in 2024, but in the February survey, it was, it was four. So there's definitely been a moderation of expectation of you know, how much interest rates will be cut um, this year and next. Hmm. Jackie, I mean, the other big week, and I have to say it was a bit of a marathon central banks this week. So well done, everyone, for getting to Friday. But we had this nice column written by our Dan Moss, basically suggesting that today or actually this week was huge for the BOJ. It hiked at last, but it doesn't mean that it's a sustained liftoff. So he doesn't say, you know, expect this rate hike to be the start of a cycle. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Bank of Japan is slightly more difficult to um, to interpret, but I'd, I'd say that that's a that's a, a realistic assumption to make that um, that this first one doesn't mean that that's now the kind of ongoing trend and direction. But if you think just how much of an about turn in monetary policy that is for the Bank of Japan compared to you know the last decade or so, um, it is still a, a pretty big move. You know, the change in um, messaging from yield curve control away from that and then the first rate hike. But yeah, I think his conclusions are, are, are yeah, a, a good way to go. 
So, Jackie, going forward, or, or do you see the most interesting complex in currencies, or do you actually see it in fixed income? Yeah, I mean, from where I sit, um, it's going to be on the currency side. Um, you know, this kind of interesting, potentially divergence in transatlantic um, interest rates, which will obviously have a huge influence on where the currency moves in the future. Um, so the, the differential between where European interest rates are expected to land versus the US, um, you, you you would expect kind of dollar strength on the back of that if those rates stay, stay slightly higher because, again, the economy is more resilient, so rates might not have to come down quite so much. So, so yeah, for, for us and the clients we're advising, it's definitely much more focused on the currencies. Jackie, thank you so much. Jackie Bowie there, Managing Partner and Head of EMEA at Chatham Financial. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, the Bank of Japan this week hiked rates for the first time since 2007, scrapping the world's last negative interest rate. Now, the move signals confidence that the country is leaving behind years of economic stagnation. But how will this massive shift disrupt people's lives across Japan and beyond? Well, Bloomberg Originals correspondent Kurumi Mori takes a look. Imagine a place where everything money-related is frozen in time for almost three decades. Your salary doesn't budge, the price of your unagi bowl doesn't change, and the interest rate on your home mortgage is closer to zero. Well, that was the reality here in Japan. We were used to the price of everything staying pretty much the same. But it wasn't always like this. Since the end of World War II, Japan has been ground zero for some of the biggest experiments in economics. Older Japanese like Tomiko, a pensioner, and Suetaka, who runs a real estate agency, have experienced a roller coaster of changes throughout their lives. Now, Japan's central bank has decided it's time to end its latest experiment and exit negative interest rates. For the first time since 2007, the Bank of Japan, or the BOJ, raised rates. YCC gone the end of negative rates as well. So how did Japan decide to manage its economy so differently from the rest of the world? And how is this massive shift going to disrupt day-to-day -day lives across the country? Japanese growth hasn't always been this stagnant. At one point, the economy was growing so fast that it looked like it was about to overtake the U.S. as the world's biggest. Taro Kimura covers the Japanese economy for Bloomberg Economics. Before, he used to work at the BOJ, so here he is with a mini history lesson. After the post-war devastation, Japan achieved something called economic miracle from the 1960s to early 1970s. That growth was led by a huge domestic demand because the middle class households were expanding. In the late 1980s, Japan's economy actually accounted for about 10% of world's total economy. At the time, many were flush with cash and reckless spending was the norm. By the end of the 1980s, the stock market was on the up and up, hitting record highs. What was crazier was the real estate price. For example, the land price of Tokyo's Imperial Palace was said to be equivalent to the price of the state of California. Then the bust came. In the first of its shock moves, the BOJ sharply raised interest rates in 1989, trying to curb speculation and rein in inflation. The government also introduced measures to cool the property sector. Nikkei stock price index fell to half of its peak value, and real estate prices also plunged that led to a long-term downturn. So Authorities had tried to pump the brakes, but instead they sent the economy to a screeching halt. 
people in Japan didn't experience wage growth and inflation for about three decades. That means one generation for people. I myself, growing up in Japan, learned the concept of inflation from macroeconomic textbook. Living in the world in no inflation make people attach a certain product with a certain price. A small amount of inflation can help drive economic growth by keeping money moving around. Most economies target relatively mild inflation of about 2%. But as you can see from the yellow, Japan's inflation stayed below that for a long time. As things got worse, the Bank of Japan followed the typical playbook for central banks, lowering interest rates. You can see the Fed, for example, slashed rates to cope with the fallout from the 2008 financial crisis. But the BOJ, for more than 20 years, kept at it with its almost flat line, but it didn't help lift the country out of deflation. In 2013, the BOJ decided to do something drastic again. It introduced the quantitative and qualitative easing policy, an unconventional move where they basically print a lot of cash and pump it into the market by aggressively buying Japanese government bonds. It was successful at first, but Japan faced deflation again a couple years later, so the BOJ went back to its box of tricks. In 2016, it adopted negative rates, a move that divided economists. The main goal was to deter saving and also punish banks that hoarded cash, but that didn't really work either. In response, the BOJ invented something called yield curve control. Yield curve control is an attempt that the BOJ controls not only short term, but also the long term rates, so that the businesses and households don't have to worry about too much fluctuation in interest rates. It could keep interest rates low by threatening to buy bonds without always having to actually buy them. That still didn't solve everything. Companies couldn't find enough profitable ways to invest their money in Japan. Many ended up looking abroad for better returns, so much so that Japan became the biggest foreign holder of U.S. Treasury debt, overtaking China. Suddenly, in 2022, all of that changed. Japan finally hit its 2% inflation target. The problem was what prompted it. First, it was higher energy costs due to the Ukraine war. And second, a weaker yen. The Bank of Japan continued easy monetary policy to stimulate the economy and even inflation. However, the other major central banks hiked rates in order to fight inflation. Eventually, it was external forces that pushed Japan toward ending its experiments. In other words, it was not the sort of inflation that Japan wanted because it wasn't coming from consumers spending more. Wages stayed low, even as inflation hit 4.3% in January 2023, which was the fastest in decades. But it still caused the yen to weaken, boosting profits at companies like Sony and Toyota, which sell products abroad. That finally brought about some signs of change. The business leaders who used to be reluctant to raise compensations in the fear of having a lot of fixed costs now started to become open to raise wages. The main labor unions secured the biggest wage increases in 30 years. So finally, on March 19, 2024, the BOJ took a big step. The Bank of Japan has ended negative interest rates 17 years since the last hike. They're scrapping the yield curve control, and they're also going to essentially pare back uh, their purchase of ETFs. Raising the interest rate from negative 0.1% to a range of 0 to 0.1% doesn't seem like much, but it does put Japan back in line with other economies. We asked at the top that if Japan's negative rates experiment ends, what now? Well, here are some of the changes we can expect to see. First, mortgages will get more expensive for the first time in decades, and interest payments on the government's more than $8 trillion of debt, which is about twice the size of the country's economy, will increase. The same thing will happen to companies. It could also propel the yen higher. That means your trips to Japan could get more expensive, and Japanese exports would take a hit too. On the flip side, it can also make investing in Japan more lucrative. Plus, cheaper fuel and food imports are good news for Japanese consumers. オフとか 30% オフとか 
まずそこの方に行ってそこで買ってそれ以外に他に必要なものは普通のお値段のところへ行って買う5年後ですか豊かになってるでしょうね10年後と言われるとわからないですけど。Well, that was Bloomberg Originals correspondent Kurumi Mori. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. My sense is still that the Fed is itchy fingers to start cutting rates. And I don't fully get it. We've got unemployment, if anything, below what they think is full capacity. We've got inflation, clearly, even in their forecast for the next two years, above target. We've got GDP growth rising, if anything, faster than potential. We have financial conditions, the holistic measure of monetary policy, at a very loose level. I don't know why we're in such a hurry to be talking about moving, to, moving towards、uh, the accelerator. Well, that was Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, speaking with Bloomberg's、uh, David Weston on Wall Street Week. Now, this is a picture of financial conditions. First of all, congratulations to Dan Curtis and his team for putting this all together. A lot of the talk, of course, has been on stocks at a record high. But actually, what we should focus our attention on is also that this is all intertwined with friendlier financing conditions. And it's very clear that these financial conditions have been loosening. Now, what this means is that companies looking to refinance、um, are, thanks to the buoyant credit markets, it means that this comes easier. Now, this has a huge interplay also with transmission of money. Monetary mechanism, but also while booming, U.S. markets have stolen much of the spotlight. Financial conditions are easing in a lot of places. I'm not only looking at the U.S., but for example, in emerging markets as well. Coming up later this morning, Pascal Donahoe, the Eurogroup president, joins us live from the Euro Summit. That exclusive conversation on the pulse at 9 10 a.m. That's daybreak, of course, and we'll have plenty more throughout the day.